Good morning, New Hope. Glad that you are here. Glad that I am here after having a couple weeks off. Uh, Grateful to Kyle and Joe for uh, the work that they did in walking you through those passages on walking in personal holiness. Uh, This morning, we're going to jump back into E2E, and we'll be in Genesis chapter 8. If you have a Bible, maybe a hard copy or electronic with you. If not, the verses will be on the screen. Especially want to welcome you if you are new to New Hope. Glad that you're with us, or if you're watching virtually this morning, you're joining us from home or from work. I want to encourage you that uh, these little booklets that we produced, E2E, they're free, and there's, uh, we printed 1,000 of them. There's like 200 left. And so if you haven't picked one up yet, make sure you get one today. They're in the atrium on your way out this morning. These are the study guides that go along with what we're working through in this Eternity to Eternity series. Um, we're going to be, as I mentioned in Genesis 8, but before we jump into that, I would just really love to pray with you about what God has to share with us this morning. So let's take a minute and pray as we prepare our hearts to receive communion and examine God's word. Let's do that together. Father, I thank you for every soul that's in this auditorium and that is in this building right now, and children that are filling the children's wing, and every single soul that's part of the service virtually. I thank you, God, that we can come together as a group of people to understand your word, but we can also do it in great freedom because of the f- price that was paid for our freedom in this country. And, and we still have the freedom to study your word and exalt and worship you, and, and nothing keeps us from that, God. So we thank you for that, and that we have the opportunity to know more about you. So God, I ask that as we learn about you this morning, that we would truly take advantage of this opportunity to walk in the things that we see in your word this morning. And it would even be evidenced in our life, not only today, but tomorrow and Wednesday and next Saturday. God, as we engage people in the workplace and in the marketplace and in our own home, that we would receive from you what you show us this morning and that we would adjust our lives accordingly. I pray for that in the matchless name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen. amen. If you were not on this planet in 2000 or 2001, you would probably not have much recollection of what I'm about to share with you. But for the benefit of those who are probably 20 years and younger, um, there was a pretty big deal in 2001 when the Los Angeles Times printed a headline that had not previously been announced. And they had published this headline simply because scientists around the world had come to a conclusion You'll understand more about why they came to the conclusion in just a moment, but they'd come to this massive conclusion about what had happened on planet Earth in our ancient past, and they had prepared an article, and because geology was revealing more and more information, the geologists decided that they would get together and publish an article, and the Los Angeles Times was the first one to come forward with the information. But days later and the weeks later, newspapers, magazines, radio stations all over the planet were publishing this information. But the headline was what captured people's attention, and the headline was, Earth's Great Extinction. And it's it's part of this area known as the Permian Extinction. And so here's the the news clipping that went with it. I'm not going to put it on the screen. I'm just going to read it to you and ask you to drink this in. Here's what came from the article. A team of scientists reported Friday that an Armageddon which wiped out nearly all life on the planet 250 million years ago may have been triggered by a massive meteor collision like the one that millions of years later helped end the reign of dinosaurs. So science came to the conclusion that there had been a global extinction, and you probably growing up in school systems today can read about it. We can read about it in many modern journals, and it's, it's known as the Great Dying. And the Great Dying's conclusion is that virtually all life on land came to an end in a very short period of time, and it was because of the geological record. Uh, I would stand here and say, science is correct. There's the record of Earth's surface that shows that there is a geological evidence of a global event that happened in the ancient past in which there were massive volcano explosions and the crustal layer of the Earth did break apart. But here is where the Bible and science diverge. Science and the Bible diverge on the cause and the timing of that huge event. The geological record and and geologists would say it's it's obvious. There's been an extinction, and it was on a global scale. You can't deny the information. 
because there has been in the past and there continues to be climate changes and geological records and we have to accept the evidence. However, what science is actually looking for is an explanation that fits with an evolutionary model. However, what the Bible demonstrates is that there is one who was there to explain it all, and that one continues to be still today, and he recorded what happened in his word called the Bible. Now, over the last number of weeks, we've looked at what God did in Genesis chapter 1 through chapter 5. And God initiates his intentions, and he makes his purposes known. But by the time you come to Genesis chapter 6, you find that his ways and his purposes are completely rejected. And mankind moves in a different direction. And because the population of the earth rejects God and actually abandons God, violence fills the earth. And because violence fills the earth, God's responses in Genesis chapter 6 and Genesis chapter 7 is that he's going to clean the slate and he's going to start over again. So just to remind you of what we looked at, just verse 17 of chapter 7, it records it this way. This is what happened at that time. Then the flood came upon the earth for 40 days and the water increased and lifted up the ark so that it rose above the earth. The water prevailed and increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark floated on the surface of the water. Verse 21, all flesh that moved on the earth perished. Birds and cattle and beasts and every swarming thing that swarms upon the earth and all mankind. Of all, verse 22, of all that was on the dry land, all in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life, died. Thus he blotted out every living thing that was upon the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things and to birds of the sky, and they were blotted out from the earth. The great dying. The truth of the great dying of a global extinction is in Genesis. And it's not the result of a meteor breaking apart the deep. To be sure, there have been meteors colliding with this planet in our distant past, but it isn't a meteor that broke apart the surface of this planet. Genesis records that the Lord God broke apart the tectonic plates and the caverns of the deep flooded and gushed up, and the waters above the heavens broke and flooded down, and this planet was completely destroyed. Over a period of 150 days, it was flooded Let me show you this from Genesis 7 again. Only Noah was left together with those who were with him in the ark. The water prevailed upon the earth 150 days. One of the things I did while I was off for a couple weeks is I was reading a a scientific journal. It was actually an ancient record of a young man who was an Indian who lived here in the state of Michigan. And he wrote these records of his own personal journal, journal all the way back in the early 1800s. It turns out that he was trained and educated by some Protestant missionaries. He lived in a region today that we call Cross Village, south of Mackinac City but north of Harbor Springs, a large Indian village area known today as La Bray Croche. And this was an area where they went in and out and traded furs, and that's where his village was at. That's where he grew up. And in his very youngest years, he was brought in by Protestant missionaries and trained in how to speak English. So as these Protestant missionaries were teaching him the Bible and showing him things about what God explains happened on planet Earth, they come to the story of the flood. And the young man stopped the Protestant missionaries and said, I've I've heard this story before. And other boys that were in the group said to the missionary, yes, we've heard this before from our grandfather and our grandfather's father. And it turned out that it had been passed down, the legacy of this story from generation to generation. The missionary was dumbfounded, like, how in the world did you know this? They didn't know. They just knew that they had always known as a tribal group that this information, long before they ever learned to speak the white man's language, was part of their culture, that there had been a global flood that had destroyed the earth. Back into this story, because Noah believes God about this flood... He finds himself adrift on an ocean freighter, free-floating in the sea, what we're calling an ark, floating on a sea of 
utter silence. Dead silence. Few things bring a greater sense of solitude than being on the open water. The the gentle slap of the waves against the hull of the ship, especially after a storm, just the dripping of the water running off the bow and onto the ocean surface. It's just so incredibly quiet. But in Noah's case, not even the sound of a seagull They're all gone. There's no life left. Everyone and everything has been submerged in a cataclysmic global flood. And Noah and his family, along with their live cargo living below, are left to repopulate the planet. So Genesis 8 captures the record for us of what happened. Go with me to this next verse, verse 1. But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the cattle that were with him in the ark, and God caused a wind to pass over the earth, and the water subsided. Also, the fountains of the deep and the floodgates of the sky were closed, and the rain from the sky was restrained, and the water receded steadily from the earth, and at the end of 150 days, the water decreased. In the seventh month of the 17th day of the month, the ark rested on the mountains of Ararat, The water decreased steadily until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains became visible. I want to bear down on that statement that started verse 1. But God remembered Noah. In the Old Testament, this word remembered, the really important word, because it's one of the great expressions of the Bible of redemption. When God remembers someone... When God remembers and takes action, it's, it's a major action of movement toward the one who's being redeemed. We misunderstand it because we think of remembered as somebody forgetting something. Let me give you an example of how it appears in the Bible in the book of Exodus. Look with me at chapter 2. The sons of Israel sighed because of the bondage, and they cried out. And their cry for help because of their bondage rose up to God. So God heard their groaning. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham. See, this is not as though God forgot. It's not like, where did I put Noah? I know he's here someplace. That's not what's going on here. Don't read it that way. The act of the remembering in Hebrew thinking is understood this way. God initiating a step towards someone in his plan of redemption. God taking action. So when you see the word remember in the Old Testament, God is moving towards that person or that group of people to carry out an action. We'll come back to that in just a moment when we get ready for communion. Let's go back into the flood. So this global flood has returned the earth to a condition similar to the beginning of creation. Except for those on the ark, the planet is empty. There's no one here. So the story keeps going this way in verse 6. Then it came about at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made, and he sent out a raven, and it flew here and there until the water dried up from the earth. Then he sent out a dove from him to see if the water was abated from the face of the land. But the dove found no resting place for the sole of her foot. So she returned to him into the ark, for the water was on the surface of the earth, Then he put out his hand and took her and brought her into the ark to himself. Now, this is really subtle, but what's going on is he's using his God-given intellect. Noah's not being told to do this. He's assessing the situation, and he's looking at what's available to him. And God's given Noah the ability to think, so he's investigating and he's researching. This is what we understand from the ancient world. Ancient mariners would use ravens and doves and send them out to find land when they were at sea. So ravens were used because they're capable of long distance, and they would fly light of sight, and they can smell land. And so a mariner only had to watch a raven to see what direction they were flying in, and they would know potentially that would be the direction to go with their ship for land. And and doves, they didn't have long range, but they would typically indicate harborage, a place where they could set the ship, 
But in Noah's case, he doesn't need them for that reason because landing sites don't matter to him. He can't steer this thing called the ark. And God's going to be the one who's going to determine where it's going to go. So what's going on here? Well, Noah's pretty conservative. And he's, he's taking a conservative approach to this for a really good reason. So he waits 40 days after the ark has run aground before he takes any action because he wants to be sure this flood is really over. So he opens up the window and the first thing he sends out is a bird of prey, a scavenger. That's what a raven is. It, it feeds on flesh. So sorry to be gross and graphic, but it's like a vulture. You've driven the highways of Michigan and around the United States and you've seen scavengers eating on carcasses that have been hit the roadkill. Well, that's what a raven does. If there's dead flesh laying anywhere, the raven is going to sniff it out. And if land is exposed, there's going to be dead bodies every place. It's going to be piled with rotting flesh. So if the raven doesn't return, it's because he doesn't need the safety of the ark and he doesn't need the food of the ark. He's feasting. So eventually, Noah learns that this raven is not coming back because there's dead carcasses everywhere. Now, where a raven is by nature a scavenger, a dove is vegetarian and that needs plant life. So a dove is going to be looking specifically not just for a place to put its feet, but also for something to eat. And doves, by their nature, are birds of the low valley and low cliffs, and they prefer heavy vegetation. So Noah's watching for this dove because it can't fly long distances, but it prefers heavy vegetation. And so if it comes back to him with something, it's going to be an indicator there's life out there. See, the raven can tell Noah there's death out there but the dove can tell him there's life out there because the dove needs plants to eat. So we find this in verse 9. The dove found no resting place for the sole of her foot, so she returned to him into the ark. So a week later, Noah sends the dove out again, and the ground apparently is still too wet and too muddy because the dove wants dry ground. It won't stand on muddy ground. So the bird flies back to the ark, but it's got this olive leaf in its mouth. And the water is receding to the lower level where the olive trees grow. Now, one of the things I found in the last couple of weeks during my research and getting ready for this is I didn't know this before, but olive trees actually can live underwater. It's one of the few trees on the entire planet that can survive in the midst of a flood. And the reason for that is it's so full of olive oil that the olive oil carries the oxygen within it and it keeps the tree alive even though it's submerged underwater. An extremely hardy tree. Some of the oldest trees, the plants living on planet Earth today, are olive trees. Now, enough time goes by. Finally, after seven more days, Noah decides to send the dove back out again. But it doesn't come back because it found a place to make its nest. It says this in verse 10. So he waited yet another seven days, and again he sent out the dove from the ark. The dove came to him toward evening, and behold, in her beak was a freshly picked olive leaf. So Noah knew that the water was abated from the earth. Then he waited yet another seven days and sent out the dove, but she did not return to him again. But all the other livestock is still on the ark. All the other animals are still on board, and they have to have plants to eat. They need vegetation, and they need to come off the ark, but they have to be able to forage. And so growth has to be taking place in order for them to be set free. Noah needs to know if the earth is blooming again. So two birds, and one reveals death, and one reveals life, and then comes verse 13, now, it came about in the 601st year, and that's the 601st year of Noah's life, by the way. In the 601st year, in the first month of the first, on the first of the month, the water was dried up from the earth. Then Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the surface of the ground was dried up. In the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth was dry, verse 15, 
Then God spoke to Noah, saying, Go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing of all the flesh that is with you, birds and animals and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that they may breed abundantly on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. Now, the last time that Noah actually heard from God was more than a year ago when God said, go in, and then God sealed the door shut behind him. And you should be noticing that during the greatest trauma of Noah's life, the greatest trauma the world has ever seen, there's only silence from God. There's no interaction recorded. Noah doesn't hear anything. A year of storms and incredibly hard work. And finally, God says, go out. But there's no explanation for the silence. In between, we're merely left with the record of this quiet trust of an obedient life who knows what God told him to do last but is not sure what he's supposed to do next. And so he keeps doing what he's been told to do, just doing what he knows to do, being incredibly faithful to God. And now Noah steps out on a dramatically reshaped earth with a new job assignment. You're going to repopulate the earth. So it's, it's kind of like Adam and Eve all over again in that they're told specifically just like Genesis 1, go out, be fruitful, and multiply Except it's not like Genesis 1 because everything's been destroyed and yet they're left alone to repopulate. And those combined four families, Noah and his wife and the three sons and three daughters-in-laws, they come down, they boil it down to the sum total of all humanity at that point in time. And yet here you are today, every one of us, everybody watching virtually, we all came from them If you want to boil it down even further, your DNA that's in you right now is Noah's DNA. Noah's DNA is in you. So verse 18, so Noah went out and his sons and his wives and his sons' wives, every beast, every creeping thing and every bird and everything that moves on the earth went out by their families from the ark. Everything we've done so far has been set up. I've been setting you up for communion so that you look at this communion table through a different lens this morning because I'm going to ask you in this moment in the midst of this story to pause and process. What was that like? See, I always try and put myself in the shoes of the individual who's going through these stories when I prepare these things to teach them. I want to ask myself, what did they see? So to be sure, Noah has emerged into a world that's been cleansed by God. And humanity has been given another chance. But for a moment, just pause and consider the aftermath. In light of what Peter writes, Peter writes in the New Testament... His life has gone on after Jesus was crucified, and he becomes a pillar of the church. And as an old man, he writes the books of 1 Peter, 2 Peter. And in 2 Peter, he begins writing about the flood. He begins writing about what happened at that time. And and there's this little nugget in verse 6 in which we get his statement. The world that then was being overflowed with water perished. And what Peter is doing, he's delineating between the world that you live in right now, the reality that we experience on this planet is different than what they experienced prior to the flood. So the world that then was, was overflowed with water, Peter wrote, so that when Noah steps off the ark, they're entering a vastly different world than what they had previously known. So then Peter writes in 2 Peter 3, 7, as a follow-up to verse 6, this. But by his word, meaning God's word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, 
So Peter's contrasting the pre-flood era with this era that you live in right now. And he's saying that was a different planet then. A different world existed than what we ourselves are now experiencing. That land, that land once teemed with animals and with people and with lush vegetation. And it was replaced by an incredibly devastated and desolate wilderness. The air had been warm and friendly. The climate was perfect for people to survive in. And now moving into the environment is a strong winds as God is drying up the earth. And he's using the evaporation and the hydrological cycles to accomplish his purposes. And there's a chill in the air on the mountain slopes. And the skies which had once been bright all the time, these new skies, they're threatening. And there's even rain To be sure, the earth had been purged of its wickedness and the corruption of humanity. And that was good. But what's left is barren and foreboding. And if it's been a long time since you've looked at the images of Mount St. Helens and what happened in 1980, do it even now. I don't care. Look it up. Look at the devastation that comes from an event on this planet and the aftermath of it. Noah's living in the aftermath and and the remnants of a global catastrophe. So here's why I started out with the LA Times report in 2001. Because geologists agree the geological record is obvious that the mountain ranges of this world on every single continent At very high elevations, there's sea life fossils, marine life fossils. So today in the Himalayan mountains, known as the rooftop of the world, there's seashells above 18,000 feet. And it's logical to ask, how did they get there? Now, science community that's non-biblical has one theory on it, but I believe there's a better biblical argument according to what God has registered here. Because mountain climbers who have gone up to the top of Mount Everest and they're on their way back down in the Himalayan mountains, they're grabbing up bags of rocks that they've brought down that have fossils of sea lilies in them above 18,000 feet. So the tech guys in the tech room are going to put an image on the screen for you of one example of one of those sea life rocks. How do you explain that up on a mountaintop? Well, it's beyond dispute. Every geologist knows that every continent on this planet has sea life up on the sides of mountains. And geologists agree that the ocean waters buried these marine fossils in limestone. That's what it represents. Here's the biblical explanation. When God reshaped the earth, when the fountains of the deep broke apart and the tectonic plates shifted, he pushed up the mountains. And they're still growing to this day. And the sedimentary rock that was taken with them that was on the surface of the earth is now up on the side of the mountains as shale. And that's how they're finding them as a result of this event. But not only that... During the rapid retreat of the water as it's going back down the sides of the mountains produces this rapid climate change. And the polar ends of the earth on this globe experience the most dramatic shift in the temperatures. And today we see the visible remnants of the aftermath of the flood in the enormous glaciers that still exist today. Our own great lakes are an example of what was produced from this period of time. But you don't just have to take my word for it. I've got evidence here from some scientists whom you would respect. Dr. Henry Morris, I told you a few weeks ago, wrote probably the most definitive book in the biblical science world on the flood event. It's simply called the Genesis Flood. It's kind of a longer quote, but I want you to see what he wrote in respect of this. It starts this way. The oceans now contain all the waters which once were above the firmament and in the subterranean reservoirs of the deep. The land areas were much less extensive than before the flood, with a much greater portion of the surface of the earth uninhabitable for this reason. The thermal vapor blanket was dissipated so that the strong temperature differentials were inaugurated, leading to a gradual buildup of snow and ice on the polar latitudes, rendering much of the extreme northern and southern land surfaces essentially uninhabitable. Keeps going. 
Mountain ranges uplifted after the flood emphasize the more rugged topography of the post-Diluvian continents, with many of these regions also becoming unfit for human habitation. Winds, storms, rains, snow were possible now, thus rendering the total environment less congenial to man and the animals than it had been before. The environment was also more hostile because of harmful radiation from space. No longer filtered out by the vapor canopy, a gradual reduction in human longevity after the flood. The crust of the earth was now in a state of general instability, reflected in recurrent volcanic and seismic activity all over the world. That's a a biblical scientist explanation. Now let me give you the Bible's explanation. Psalm 104. Verse 6, the waters were standing above the mountains. At your rebuke, they fled. At the sound of your thunder, they hurried away. The mountains rose, the valleys sank down to the place which you established for them. You set a boundary that they may not pass over so that they will not return to cover the earth. So when Noah and Mrs. Noah step off the ark they enter a dramatically different world. Everything that was once pristine has been utterly annihilated. And the first thing that they are aware of is God's judgment against sin because wrath has been delivered. And like you and I, they would literally have to gasp and gag at the same time. They're gasping because there's mountains where there have not been mountains and there's valleys where there have not been valleys. And they're gagging because death is piled up everywhere. Decaying, rotting corpses, both humans and animals. And to add to the eerie setting, a dead silence. No one is alive, no neighbors, no friends, and the aftermath of the flood is a stark, indescribable proof of God's wrath against sin. Here's where you and I struggle in 2022. Most of us have a cartoon-like image in our mind of that experience. And so we've seen children's books, coloring books, and illustrated drawings that show a grinning hippopotamus next to a smiling monkey and a rainbow over their head and green grass everywhere. That isn't reality. There's vegetation, to be sure, but there is death and desolation everywhere. It certainly is not Eden. Just Think of the news images that you've seen after a flood devastates a region and what's left in its aftermath. Put that on a global scale. So as I said to you, I always try and put myself in the shoes of the individual who's walking through this. If you are Noah in this moment, the first thing you are overwhelmed with is the awesomeness of God and the judgment that he has just delivered. And that explains verse 20. Then Noah, he did something in response. He built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. No wonder, no wonder he built this altar. Because if you study the burnt offerings of the Bible, you'll find burnt offerings are totally consumed to the point of ash. There's nothing left. And the purpose within that is to symbolize this total dedication saying, I'm completely giving everything over to you. I completely give you my life. I'm consecrating myself to you. So Noah is saying, we totally dedicate ourselves to you. You are awesome, and we belong to you. But there's more than that going on in the burnt sacrifice because a burnt sacrifice is also a sin offering. And so we understand that Noah recognizes what you and I recognize. He's not a perfect man. 
He doesn't have a perfect wife. And he knows that he's before a perfect God. So he builds this altar. And let me share an insight with you from John MacArthur. He was looking at the same passage and made this comment. When they come face to face with the devastation of judgment, they are struck by the fact that this same judgment is essentially what they personally deserve, and they know it. No one knows he's not a perfect man. He knows he's not married to a perfect woman and doesn't have three perfect sons and perfect daughters-in-law. He knows they are sinners. So what is their first response after seeing God's wrath? And all that they know and all that's swimming around in their head and all that they've seen, well, it's verse 20. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord. See, worship is Noah's first response. And here's what I've come to the conclusion of personally. We worship best when we are most aware of the enormity of what God has done for us. When we're in that place that we recognize, we don't deserve this. We worship really, really well. And Noah is overwhelmed by the magnificence of what God has done to preserve him and his family because he's been an eyewitness to the staggering wrath of God that's been poured out on a really wicked world. And he saw God's fury and his judgment against sinners, and yet Noah has this sin nature just like you and I. And so the Bible reveals that the only reason he wasn't drowned it's for the same reason you and I aren't experiencing eternal damnation. Genesis 6, 8, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Gratefully, you and I today don't have to do burnt offerings and we don't have to do sacrifices. You don't have to find a priest to drag a lamb before because Jesus is the final sacrifice. Like half of you believe that apparently. Okay, I'll give you another shot. Jesus is the final sacrifice. Amen. Gratefully, we don't have to go before a priest. However, each time we celebrate communion, not only are we being obedient in that action to remember his work on the cross, not only are you going to carry that out in just a moment, but just like Noah, in the same action of coming before what we would call the altar of God, when you're picking up the elements of communion, in that same action, we're also recognizing we deserve judgment. We didn't earn this. We deserve judgment for our sin. We deserve eternal death. We didn't earn the ark of our salvation. Jesus did. He paid it all. All to him I owe. So that's why communion is so important. You might think this would be a really good point to transition to communion. And it would, but it would be incomplete if I didn't give you one last tiny section. God has a response, and the response to what Noah has done is verse 21. The Lord smelled the soothing aroma, and the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground on account of man, for the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth, and I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done, while the earth remains, verse 22, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. Now, when we see the words, the Lord smelled a soothing aroma, we have this image that pops in our mind that somehow what Noah just did soothed God and made God say, oh, you know what? I'm never going to do that again. Look how good Noah's heart is. That's not what's going on here. As much as we don't even understand the word remembering, God remembering, we don't understand what's going on here unless we really dig into this. So God is not smelling the soothing aroma and saying, okay, I'm not going to do that again. Rather, it's a, it's a metaphor. It's an anthropomorphism. It's a way of God being responsive in his pleasure with the heart of a worshiper. In the same way that God is pleased with you coming to the communion table this morning and picking up the elements, 
you'll find as you go through the books of Exodus and Numbers and Leviticus, that same phraseology is used of the imagery of God smelling a soothing aroma. Meaning God's pleased with the heart of the person who's come before him in recognition of who he is and who they really are. So some of you today might even be going to graduation open houses and maybe as you're approaching the house, somebody's doing a barbecue and before you ever hit the house, what hits you is the smell of the barbecue. And even if the guy burned the snake, you're going, the steak, you're going, that'd be gross if they're burning snakes. (laughs) Even if they burn the steak, by the time you hear it, it's like, oh baby, that smells so good. Now it may be blacker than charcoal by the time you get to the grill, But the smell, it lingers with you. That's a a metaphor that's capturing the image of God's pleasure towards Noah's heart and that he's recognized. You know who I am, Noah. And you know who you are. And I'm really pleased with that. But in the same passage in verse 21, God says, the human heart is incredibly evil, even from childhood. So if God were to respond in the way that he did in the flood to every time human corruption surfaced, he would have to schedule worldwide catastrophes in every generation to punish the rampant sin actions. So in response we find the enormous grace of God revealed in his own words when he says, while the earth remains, meaning it's not going to remain forever, but while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, winter and snow, while the earth remains, it shall not cease, and no one needed to hear that, and you and I need to hear this. Because even though the thoughts of mankind, many individuals have surfaced on how they think this world is going to end, God is saying right here, it's not going to end the way you think it's going to end. It's going to end eventually, but it's going to end according to my timing and my plan. You can't change it, Noah. It will come to an end, but it's predetermined when. It is not your job to control it. And to remind us that we're not in control, he's in control, he gives a rainbow as the sign of that. Now, setting aside all the cultural adaption that's happened in the last 30, 40 years over the rainbow image, just get that imagery out of your mind. Go with the biblical imagery here. For millennia, the rainbow is this persistent reminder that even though mankind deserves total punishment for sin, God says the punishment is going to be withheld, Noah. Temporarily, while the earth still remains, I'm not going to obliterate this planet until I pour out my wrath one more time when God's full wrath was no longer held back on one very dark afternoon on a hill called Mount Calvary when he poured out his full wrath against God the Son. He did it for us. He took the wrath of God for us as he hung up on a cross The full wrath of God poured out on him as the ultimate expression of God's grace and God's wrath in one action. Hear that again, church. The full and greatest measure of God's wrath is not the flood of Noah. The full measure of his wrath was placed on his son as he hung on a cross. It's the ultimate expression of God's wrath. And God's grace in one action when he who knew no sin became sin for us. 2 Corinthians 5.21. Scripture is very clear about that. Jesus had no sin. He didn't deserve the judgment or the wrath of God. 
And yet voluntarily he took the sin, the weight, the devastation, the destruction of the world upon himself. And he became sin for us. That God would send his only son to rescue us from the punishment that we deserve. That tells you and I that Jesus is our ark. He is the one who rescues us from the wrath of God. And God's wrath is righteous and it's just, but his grace is greater than all my sin. I know you agree with that. And so Jesus becomes our ark and he takes the wrath of God upon himself for those who will believe. So as we come to the communion table this morning, we come with that in our mind, just like Noah came to the altar. God, I know what I deserve, and I know who you are, and I know who I am. Thank you for preserving me. So this is your opportunity for an act of worship. In tradition of New Hope, I'm going to read to you the same paragraph I always read to you from 1 Corinthians. It's Paul's instructions to the church from chapter 11. He said, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. If you're new to New Hope, you need to know that we have open communion here. What you need to do to participate is be a believer in Jesus Christ. Paul recognizes the weight of the reality of what you're about to do because he gives a huge warning. And his warning is that we would examine ourselves, that we not take what we're about to do lightly. And the warning comes from verse 27. There, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. It's the Bible's way of saying, make sure you're in a place of relationship with the Father, that you're not treating this lightly. Because we know what it costs. So this time we allow here at New Hope is for you to examine yourself quietly in your own seat. Before you come and pick up the elements, just talk to the Father. Anything you've got to deal with, deal with it now. And then in the back in the atrium, there's tables, and here in the front, come to either one that you would like to. Pick up the elements and take them back to your seat, and I will talk you through the rest. But this time right now, it's for you to talk to your Father.